Hello and welcome to another episode of Sensational She Geek Live from Yancey Street. Today is Monday, October 4th, 2021, and this is episode 36A. On this lovely A episode, we're going to start things off with the news, of which we are pretty much just discussing rumors. MCU rumors, to be specific, and we're going to talk about that whole rumor situation and pretty much all the rumors that have been going in that ridiculously overcharged rumor mill and what any of that might mean and what the point of all that could possibly be. Um, And then we, of course, have the new Comic Book Day poll list, of which there are um, a number of really cool things coming out, including the Wonder Woman 80th Anniversary Spectacular, which I will talk more about when we get there. And after the poll list, uh, probably a little bit briefly, because it was honestly fairly easy to explain episode, Doom Patrol Season 3, Episode 4. It did premiere last Thursday, I believe, on... HBO Max, but I waited till today to talk about it just because there's a lot of stuff happening um, on B episodes and a little bit less happening on A episodes, so we're spreading the wealth out a little bit. Wouldn't that be nice? You know what I really should do for one of these episodes is get a chart for when all of the comic book properties are hitting our eyeballs, you know, be it on TV or in cinema. Um, I really need to get it in a chart. There was that one chart circulating back, I think, at the beginning of the year that showed, oh yeah, there's going to be a Disney plus Marvel MCU thing every week through the end of the year. And that's obviously already at this point in the year proven not to be true. Um, But things have like just been shuffled around very slightly. I'm not sure what it is, but I need to... Um, I need to get that all kind of on track, keep track of that a little bit better so that I know what's coming next. I know the Hawkeye Disney Plus show is in December, Eternals is in November, No Way Home is in December. I feel like there's a show that I'm missing somewhere in here that's coming. Um, I'm not sure. (laughs) This is why I need exactly a good good reason to uh, do one of these, um organizational things on one of these episodes to kind of get everybody on the same page of what is happening in the MCU, but also the DCEU, because uh, they're bound to have stuff coming out, and there's all kinds of DCEU rumors we've already discussed in previous episodes uh, regarding the Flash movie and whatnot, so um, we'll just, we'll, we'll someday we'll just cover it all, get all the dates straightened out, um, so we all know what to expect next. Per usual, you can find me online. Let's, if you would like to say anything about a podcast, if you have any input, any questions, comments, concerns, anything like that, the uh, best way to find me is on Instagram. My username is Anna with the comics because um, that's my name and I have lots of comics. It's pretty much what I post about that and my cat and sometimes food. Um, I also have a Twitter, Savage She Geek. I, if I post any updates on the podcast, it'll be there. I have my website, which is full of all kinds of things to check out, and that is www.sensationalshegeek.weebly.com. Um, I have old writing from the podcast. Well, it was from before I did the podcast, so I kind of transferred writing over to just speaking for the podcast. But So all of those old written pull lists and pick lists and reviews and discussions and theories and things like that can all be found on uh, my website's blog archive um, as well as reading orders for some of my favorite female characters. Um, My pod notes are what I go through on an episode for, it's it's a bi-weekly podcast so I have uh, two note pages per week that I go through and make notes on things throughout the week so that I don't get too off track. Um, and make sure that I hit all the points that I want to hit. And that is made available on my website blog, um, so that anybody who would like to read the news can do that rather than listen to me talk, or for anyone who is hearing impaired who would still like to keep up with the podcast. Last, other things, the other thing you can find on my website would be the links to absolutely everywhere that you can listen to this podcast, which does include YouTube, where I have all of the podcasts episodes as um, videos all in the same playlist. I also post on YouTube action figure review videos because I'm not a big enough dork as it is. 
um, most recent thing that has been posted was the Hasbro Marvel Legends HasLab from 2020, the Sentinel. Um, I'm pretty sure most people who ordered one should have had theirs arrive by now. Um, fingers crossed all of the orders have gone through perfectly fine and you have received your Sentinel. Um, if you have not or if you have any questions about the Sentinel, you can refer to my video uh, as a brief overview and reveal of what to expect uh, if you are to receive a Sentinel from them. And of course, next year is going to be the Galactus action figure, which is going to be much larger than the Sentinel, so it's going to be even bigger of a deal when that one arrives. If you would like to support the podcast, the best way to do that is, of course, sharing it, um, linking it to people who you think will enjoy it, um, share it with your com different online communities who are into comics and uh, the action figures, whatever other things. Um, or if you would like to do so, you can, of course, donate to the podcast, support it that way. I do have a podcast Patreon. It is Sensational She Geek. Uh, the whole idea behind the Patreon at this point being you know, whether you feel like the podcast is worth a price of a comic book a month, the price of a movie ticket a month, whatever, um, you know, it may be worth to you, completely voluntary. Um, this podcast will never cost anybody anything to listen to. There will eventually be episodes when I have a big enough Patreon following that, um, premiere for Patreon before anyone else. Um, special edition episodes like the Marvel Inferno prep podcast that I did, I believe, last week. You can go check that out if you have any questions about the current Inferno event going on. But that is the kind of thing that I will be making more regularly once I have a um, large enough following on Patreon and on the podcast itself um, so that there is a audience for all of that. I also have a Kofi, K-O-F-I, coffee. I don't know how you're supposed to say it, um, but it's like a one-time donation thing. The whole idea behind it being, um, you know, donate $3, $5, whatever you feel like doing on this one-time occasion to assist you, this creator who you follow in continuing to put out work um, for, for that they can buy a cup of coffee or whatever while they do their work. It's a pretty neat idea. Um, I'm on there under She Geek. Um, so if you would like to donate to the podcast in either of those ways, they are there for you to do so. I think now is good a time to go ahead and kick things off with the news. Like I said at the beginning of the podcast, the news segment for this episode is going to be pretty much just covering the MCU rumors as they have grown and progressed so far. Uh, because there are some new ones that have come out in the past week that have kind of kicked off the viability of some of these other rumors. You'll see what I mean here. Because this new rumor, um, apparently there are some websites who are out there saying that they have confirmation that a new Punisher series is in development with John Bernthal coming back to play Frank Castle, the Punisher. Pause for dramatic effect. Um, basic rundown of this, the Punisher, of course, came uh, as a Netflix show, was part of the whole Daredevil universe for the Netflix stuff that they, uh, that the MCU Netflix stuff that they had over there. Um, they're not exactly connected to the MCU. There's been references to the MCU in Daredevil, um, but they have never made that jump over. Um, lots of people, of course, want that jump to be made, but let's go ahead and cover this particular bit of news before we get for more into the other rumors. Um, some of the sites that are claiming to have this confirmation include We Got This Covered and Giant Freaking Robot, which, if the names didn't tell you, um, are kind of known for creating fake news for clicks. <laughs> Uh, it's good old stuff. Um, there is a website, though, called Small Screen that is a little bit better known um, that is also saying that they have... Um, there's a quote here. It says, We value our sources completely, and even though we get tips and information every day, we only run with sources we trust. So they seem to be pretty serious about this, whatever the source they have is, which is completely unnamed, of course. 
Um, what the report says, though, is that, quote, Charlie Cox, John Bernthal, and Kristen Ritter have all been in negotiations to appear in multiple MCU projects. Bernthal really wants to play the Punisher, but again has, uh, what is it? But yes, but again has been negotiating hard on the contract. Um, and then it says that there's also a script for the Punisher show already. Um, and the source is quoted to be saying, it sounds fucking badass. Uh, it's looking like it'll be pretty violent, just like the Netflix show. I think it'll be the MCU's most violent show yet. It won't be a continuation from the previous show, though. It sounds as though it'll be a new start, probably in an alternate timeline. So that's what we have for the specific rumor. Um, may or may not be a, um, Disney MCU, Disney parented Punisher show because of course they're not going to put it out on Disney Plus if it's going to be a Punisher show like the way we hope it would be on probably Hulu or Stars if they ever get Stars to be streamable on Disney Plus or with a Disney Plus service in the US here that is not the case as of this time at least um, I don't think they would put it on Stars unless it was something that was more accessible to people who have Disney Plus um, MCU type interests you know um, but anyway, so that's that's that rumor. And just to kind of wrap up the rumors about these Netflix characters who I mean, this, these rumors have been coming for a while now. So let's 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 get them all onto the same page here. So we have the new one is the Punisher. There have been rumors going on, oh gosh, for months now, if not longer, that Charlie Cox is gonna be returning as Matt Murdock in Spider-Man No Way Home, or perhaps even She-Hulk, due to the fact that they are both superhero lawyers. Now, I'm sure we've all seen or heard the extreme, extremely vague, I guess, theories about how, oh, if you look in the No Way Home trailer, that's probably Matt Murdock played by Charlie Cox. You can't see him. And, you know, he's wearing his watch on that wrist. And that means, you know, blah, blah, blah. Real deep cut tease type of things. Um, where I, you know, when I watch that, to be honest, maybe 10% chance in my mind that that was actually Charlie Cox playing Matt Murdock in the Spider-Man No Way Home trailer or that he would even show up, period. It, um, it seemed to be a pipe dream. Is that the right term for it? Just a, just a flippant dream. Um, I can't even tell you. I'm, I'm sure if you're a fan of the, of the Netflix MCU stuff, I'm, you will, I'm sure, understand how incredible that would be to get those projects and those characters into the main MCU. Um, and there's been other rumors, of course, like Kingpins, uh, played by Vin Vincent D'Onofrio, has been rumored to be one of the villains in Hawkeye, and then also being a villain in the Echo series, which is going to be coming on Disney+, Plus, which again is rumored to serve as a surrogate Daredevil season four. It goes on and on. My point here being, it's starting to look like this shit might actually be happening. <laughs> Um, especially with the addition of the the recent addition of Venom officially being that's that's not something that I was pulling out of my butt in the last podcast episode. That is official from the Venom Let There Be Carnage movie post credit scene. Venom is now a part of the MCU. No idea what that's going to mean as far as the future of the MCU and Spider-Man and Venom versus the the Disney side of the what was that Marvel Disney side of stuff as opposed to the Sony Disney side of the Sony Marvel side of stuff. Um, no idea what it means for that, but that's a, that's 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 a big move. Um, that's I I I feel like that can't be ignored. Um, and also what can't be ignored when you're discussing all these other rumors that have been coming up recently in the past couple of months regarding these Netflix shows. We have Alfred Molina's Doc Ock confirmed showing up in No Way Home as well. And likely the Raimi Green Goblin and 
other villains from the Raimi movies or possibly even the Amazing Spider-Man movies. Um, things that I myself, you can go back and listen to me say that there is no way that those things are actually going to be happening. I mean, it's practically confirmed that we got all three Spider-Men there. Like, I'm not saying that I'm super on board with that. I'm just saying that it seems that the rules that we once judged these superhero films, the rules we once theorized about these superhero films over, they are no longer valid. Um, And that just kind of, every time one of these rumors gets stacked on top and we don't I, we we don't find you know even ninety percent oh that's that's probably not gonna happen like ninety percent of us aren't even doing that at this point was <laughs> I'm pretty sure ninety percent of us are on board with this all being you know, true uh, it's just it's just so nuts um, I I can't say that I don't think any of this is gonna happen now knowing what we know which in the big picture is very little. What we know about No Way Home and Multiverse of Madness and whatever is coming in the MCU after, I mean, even Hawkeye, like we know so little. Um, they've only, we only know what we have been allowed to know with the exception of, I suppose, what would be the things that made these rumors start in the first place, which were like ridiculous rumors ridiculous theories and sources from, you know, stuff we could never believe. And again, I I can't say that I'm super on board with everything that looks like is going to be happening in No Way Home, Um, but if it's going to mean that it is a doorway to more of these, well, any of these Netflix uh, MCU characters to join the official MCU, I will put up with the cheesiness. I will put up with the clickbait articles about how it's a cinematic masterpiece tying in the world's greatest Spider-Man project with all the other ones. I will listen to all of that bullshit if it means we get the Netflix MCU characters back in the main MCU. I I hope you agree with me. Um, (laughs) Because that's, that's so cool. I mean, Kristen Ritter obviously. Um, well, it actually goes on. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So, it goes on from that, because we, of course, we have Charlie Cox as Daredevil, Vincent D'Onofrio as Kingpin, Kristen Ritter as Ju- as Jessica Jones, and Mike Coulter as Luke Cage. We had a Defender show in there. We had an Iron Fist show in there that we don't really need to discuss because it was pretty much across the board a disaster. Um, but you can bet your butt that they will pay that actor at F- Finn Jones? Is his name Finn Jones? Something Jones. They will, because it was that whole story, I don't know if it was true, about how he refused to do the fight training because he felt like he was too hotty totty or whatever. Um, you can bet your butt that they will get him into an ironclad contract to make him a better iron fist. Um, or just replace him. No, I. Uh, if we're doing the whole multiversal thing, you can definitely just replace him. <laughs> um. Although, if he's the only one out of this group to be replaced, it would be a little bit icky. Um, the other rumor, actually, I, I'm, I'm seeing it now on my notes. I he forgot to mention it earlier about the Punisher is that he, while he may or may not be getting the show, he is supposedly going to be introduced in the Moon Knight series. Um, to quote the source, he says, or they say, like a cameo or something. Nice, vague little quote there they got for us. Um, this is something that would make a fair amount of sense. Um, <laughs> depending on what happens between now and the Moon Knight series premiering, it could make even more sense. Um, again, there's really no way, like, now that we've seen, now that we've had what little confirmed that we have had confirmed, it, so- it feels stupid to say no way to any of these. Um, it's just, it's just that <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I would, I get into ahead of myself because I keep writing off all of the rumors I don't care about if it means that I will get the ones that I do care about. Um, so this could end up being a double-edged sword with there being just a jumble of stuff that doesn't end up making sense uh, to 
at least some audience members. Um, I gotta hope that the people at Marvel have faith in the audience to keep up and that they will throw all of these Netflix characters at us. That's kind of what I'm hoping right now. Um, this whole Netflix MCU thing started, of course, in 2015 when Daredevil premiered. Um, and the thing that brought all of this back into the conversation was last year, the rights for all of those Marvel characters on the Netflix shows reverted back to Marvel, meaning back to like Disney Marvel, the main MCU situation. Um, and that was where all of these rumors kind of started. And it's really looking more and more like there is going to be some meat to them. So I'm curious what you guys think. Um, are there other rumors that I've missed in bringing them up? Um, are there things that you think cancel out some of these rumors and make them false? Um, what What do you think? Uh, do you think we're going to see Charlie Cox in the MCU or, you know, Vincent D'Onofrio as Kingpin, or Kristen Ritter as Jessica Jones, or even Mike Coulter as Luke Cage in the MCU. Do you think that's possible? I'm curious what you guys all think. The last little bit of rumors that I wanted to mention here was something that my husband and I were talking about a few nights ago, and that was that um, I, had, I had mentioned it before, there was rumors about a scene in Multiverse of Mag Madness where Scarlet Witch was going to be fighting a character from the Fox Men movies, but it was kind of like a loose rumor. And I guess the the full thing here is that Patrick Stewart is the one who is supposedly fighting Scarlet Witch. Um, Charles Xavier, played by Patrick Stewart. It's not just Patrick Stewart. Um, fighting Wanda's Scarlet Witch. That is Fox Men... Charles Xavier, the OG Charles in the wheelchair with the bald head, Patrick Stewart, Wanda from the MCU, WandaVision, I don't know who you are, you know, fighting. <laughs> if this, if this was any other character played by any other actor going against Scarlet Witch, I would probably not give a shit. Or be like, okay, yeah, that's cool, whatever. But if they get Patrick Stewart... Because, guy, grow up, Patrick Stewart was my Professor X. When I was growing up watching movies, those were the movies that I watched for the X-Men. Granted, I was not a child who was allowed to watch the animated show as a kid, or the Batman animated stuff, or really any normal kids' TV, but we watched the X-Men movies. Patrick Stewart, as Charles Xavier, was the first time that that entity was in my brain so um i would i would be pretty excited about that um it does have also <laughs> this rumor does have a tiny bit of validity to it in that the show picard which of course stars patrick stewart um as something like it was filming around the corner from the marvel studios lot or across the street or something like that where it would be ridiculously convenient to have slipped him in for an hour of filming and gotten back to work for Picard. So that is where, um, and of course, among the other rumors, which are enormous, really, at this time, um, this is one that I can definitely see being super easy for them to do, especially after they very purposely teased the Fox men coming back, but did not give it to us. I don't honestly want that, but I would love a Charles Xavier, Patrick Stewart cameo, um, with Quicksilver, good old, what's his name? Who was not Quicksilver in WandaVision. Um, <laughs> that was kind of like a funny little, like nudging us with their elbow. Like <laughs> you thought it was going to be, but it wasn't. So now I feel like they kind of owe that in a sense. Um, but if it's, is Patrick Stewart, who was going to be in that cameo, I feel like they're doing it the smart way. Um, I just don't... I Like Ma like McAvoy, I don't think that would have been a good choice. Um, plus that era of the movies is a little different than the uh, first three movies. And it's just some continuity issues and things. You know, if you've seen them all, you understand. So to wrap up this news, which is really rumors segment... Um, what I'm saying here basically is, uh, anything can happen, but also 
any of this can be completely fake, so we'll just have to wait and see, basically. <laughs> Starting off the new comic book day poll list this week, we're gonna- we got it actually numerically correct this time. We're going one through- what is the biggest one we have? 75? Uh, it's not 75 comics we're talking about, it's only like 10. Uh, starting off though with Eternals Celestia number one. This is a one shot written by Kieran Gillen with art by Kei Zama that is supposed to be prepping audiences for the Eternals movie coming out in November. Um, what it says here is there is no God for the Eternals. Now that the truth of their existence is revealed, Ajak and Makari must pick up the pieces and try to find a road forward, no matter how terrifying it will be or how their choices will irrevocably shock the rest of the Eternals. Also, how did the Avengers of 1 million BCE figure into it? Um, this is, of course, referencing the Eternal series by Kieran Gillen and Asad Ribic that recently revealed that while the Eternals are revived by their great machine each time they die, it does that by taking a human life and giving it to them. <laughs> life for life and all that kind of stuff. Um, so being a species of people who, A, uh, for most of their existence, believed that they were uh, special and had a place in the universe and a destiny, which turned out to be completely false. They were just an experiment that was cast to the side when they got boring. Um, and B, a group of people who are superheroes for the most part, um, meant to protect and watch over humanity. Learning that was a pretty big uh, slap to the face for the Eternals. So <laughs> that's what it's meaning about the truth of their existence being finally revealed. So um, spoilers, I suppose, but we know that the next books of the, or next comics of the Eternals series are going to feature Thanos as the leader of the Eternals. Shit's gonna go crazy here. Um, and I'm really, this is a one shot, so I'm really curious, um, how they're kind of gonna s sum things up to this point. We've, we've had a lot of development in the Eternals. I'm curious how they're going to sum things up. Um, but also, just thinking about it again, if this is supposed to be setting things up for the movie, that means more or less that everything that we have seen of the recent Eternals stuff has been, as we've kind of theorized, and it has been um, realigning things so that they will be kind of prepping audiences for the movie before this issue even comes out. So I can pretty much imagine at this point that that triangular looking ship thing that um, comes out of the ground in the Eternals trailer is their machine where they are revived. Um, we could probably pretty much assume that they are revived anytime they do die or are hurt um, and that when that happens they take a human life and probably don't know it. Um, we can also probably assume far easier than that, even, that the Celestials um, are going to pull that one over them, you know, like they did in the comics about like, oh yeah, totally, you're like destined for greatness, we have plans for you among the stars and stuff, we'll be back. And then just like abandon them forever because they actually don't care. Um, I, I fully expect to see that happening in the movie, that revelation as well. The Wonder Woman 80th Anniversary 100 page super spectacular number one. This special needs no introduction, especially after that long wordy title. <laughs> it's basically just celebrating the 80 years of Wonder Woman and the many, many eras and the many things that she stands for. Um, to kind of give you a preview of what to expect for this, I will go over the writers and the artists, basically just the creators who are on board. Um, if there are any names you recognize, that is a reason for you to pick this up, right? So for writers, we have Jordi Belair, Mark Wade, G. Willow Wilson, Becky Cloonan, Tom King, Steve Orlando, Vita Ayala, Stephanie Phillips, Michael Conrad, and Amy Reader. Uh, for artists, and we do have a number of heavy-hitting Wonder Woman writers in that list. For artists, we have Amy Reader again, Joe Prado, Marcio Takara, Evan Shaner, Really? Okay. Um, Jim Chung, Megan Hetrick, Laura Braga, Paulina Ganu Chao, and Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. Um, 
also a couple of really good ones in there. I am a big fan of Laura Braga and Marcia Takara, and then of course Megan Hetrick I am a patron of. Uh, if you're looking for which cover you want to get for this, there are some really, really fantastic ones uh, out of probably 10 or 12 available, which are by Yannick Paquette, Cliff Chang, Travis Moore, Kat Staggs, Bruce Tim, Michael Cho, Natalie Sanders, Will Mirai, Rose Besh, Jen Bartel, and Sun Kamunaki. So it's a, it's a couple of really, really good names. I know the Rose Besh one is a really cool homage to Perez Wonder Woman. Um, and then the Jen Bartel is a really cool wraparound cover where you have, I believe, four or five different eras of Wonder Woman looks spread across the two covers. Um, so there's a couple of really fun ones there that you can look out for. Um, as a fan of Wonder Woman who has a really hard time to find Wonder Woman st stories that I like. It's a funny thing, isn't it, how that happens? Um, I have read the past three creative teams worth of Wonder Woman series, which is probably over the course of almost three years. Um haven't liked much of it at all. <laughs> Not a bit. Um, but looking at this list, there's a couple of things to look forward to, even if you're in that same ballpark of you, you haven't really matched up with any of the Wonder Woman content coming from DC. This is going to be an anthology book, so all of these stories written by all these different writers, they're not necessarily canon. Um, so the writers have a little bit more room to be creative and to do their own thing with it, and that tends to be, in my opinion, where writers come out with the better works, especially for the big two cape heroes who have been around for, like Wonder Woman, literally 80 years. Um, and also, the list of names that we have for these writers. Um, now, granted, artists are very, very, very important when it comes to comic storytelling, but the writers are kind of traditionally where that starts. Um, and there's a number here that I am a big fan of. Um, gosh, Jordi Belair wrote the Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy. Actually, was that Jordi Belair? No, that was Jody Hauser, I think. Jodi Blair is um, she's a she's a well known color. She works on Black Widow for coloring, but she also writes. Uh, Mark Wade did the Invisible Woman series a few years ago that completely blew my pants off. What you know what I mean? Uh, G Willow Wilson is known for a couple of things, but she writes. Um, well, bro, I think it's over now. Invisible City, which was a fantastic indie series with Christian Ward, Becky Cloonan and Michael Conrad couldn't pretty much be guaranteed as to writing their story together because they are partners in life as well as in work and they are working on the current Wonder Woman series together. Tom Keen I've talked about a number of times uh, when it comes to comics and how much I love them by him. Steve Orlando is honestly the only one in this list who I have yet to find a comic that I enjoy written by him. Vita Ayala is doing the current New Mutants and I am adoring it and they tend to have just an excellent grasp of the characters that they're writing. And finally, Stephanie Phillips is doing the current Harley Quinn stuff, um, which I have talked about to death practically and I just absolutely adore it. So there's a really good list of reader of of writers in here. It's a pretty good spread between male and female and non-binary character uh, creators. Um so I don't have too much to bitch about with this. We'll have to wait and see what the actual stories are um so I can report back on which of them I enjoyed. The second issue of Dark Ages comes out this week. Um, it is number two of six. This is a. Um, this is not a event. This is a series outside of the main Marvel Six One Six comic book universe. Basically, what happened in the first issue was this ancient being at the center of the planet is waking up and causing all kinds of havoc. And if it completely wakes up, it's basically going to unmake all of reality. Um, and so they send a bunch of Avengers and heroes to the center of the earth in this desperate attempt to destroy it, um, including Sue Storm and Doctor Strange are the only two I can remember off the top of my head, but they all die minus Sue Storm, uh, who Doctor Strange is able to save as he dies, um, 
but what he does as he's also dying to, to kind of try and save the moment is he opens up a universe that is an EMP, basically, and electromagnetic pulse, the entire universe is that. So he opens that doorway and it knocks out the power of the unmaker that's destroying uh, the center of the earth. But then Strange dies, so the doorway remains open, and that EMP energy, I suppose, gets out and wipes out all electronics across the world, theoretically the entire universe. Um, what we saw at the end of the issue was that there were a, a series of heroes who were together still, and a series of heroes who were uh, horsemen of apocalypse now including Reed Richards and Miles Morales. It's a fun mix of heroes who have turned villains. I don't even know what's going to happen, but I'm stoked to see it. I'm sure it's going to be wild. This is written by Tom Taylor, who is one of the best outside of canon writers for the big two I've ever come across. Um, this is going to be years after the first issue takes place, which we kind of see at the end of the first issue anyway. Uh, what it says in the solicitation, now Earth's heroes attempt to bring humanity together in the darkness. X-Men and Avengers, vigilantes and villains all work together to create something better, but something darker than the night is descending on our world. Our post-apocalyptic world is about to face the apocalypse. Meaning, of course, apocalypse the character. Uh, shit's gonna go down. Mirka and Dolfo's Red Sonia number two. I enjoyed the first issue a good amount, honestly a lot more than uh, some of the other Red Sonia stuff that has come out of late. This is of course by Mirka and Dolfo and Giuseppe Caffaro, who is an Italian artist, and it comes from Dynamite, as Dynamite does own Sonia these days. The solicitation says, Sonia struggles to recover from injuries, relying on Sitha to help her. Their bond grows, and as they travel from city to hamlet, and as Sonia discovers more about Sitha's past, the more dangerous their path becomes. Sitha is a child who was being hunted, um, who Sonia kind of came across and rescued. Uh, the girl is obsessed with Sonia, believes her to be her mother. Sonia does not understand that at all. Um, and the girl is just a big mystery. She's somehow magical, um, potentially related to Sonia in some way for real. I don't know, but we will find out and I'm, I'm probably going to keep on this one for a while. Defenders number three of five. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty fun. I like the characters who are in it, which is a big part of why I'm going to try and keep up with it. Um, like I said, it is only five issues. So this is going to be over halfway through. Um, we'll just read you the solicitation because I don't honestly remember what happened in the last issue besides Galactus's mom became a member of the team. It says, The debut of the deadly Moradin. Doctor Strange and his misfit crew land in a world of dark primal magic where our world's master of the mystic arts is just a magical morsel for countless hungry sorcerers. The most powerful entity on this plane, the maker of magic itself, already knows the defenders and their mission. Their paltry abilities be nothing to him, save one, the power to move between cosmos. All of existence lies vulnerable as the defenders find themselves outmatched. The Me You Love in the Dark is coming out this week with issue three of five as well. This is by Scotty Young with art by Jorge Corona and it is from Image Comics. There is only one brief line in the solicitation. It says, Ro becomes even more intimate with whoever or whatever is haunting the old house as she finds the spark of inspiration for her most personal paintings yet. This story has been super cool. Um, totally spooky, up my alley kind of stuff where this artist rents this spooky old house to try and um, get some motivation to go back to working on her art and winds up befriending this entity that lives in the house. Um, seems to be some kind of demon thing and interestingly they are growing closer in their relationship. So one thing I wanted to say here was that it's, if you look at all the covers, it is worth noting that the main cover art tells a story of its own in a way or is at least foreshadowing what happens in each issue. If you look at the first, the first issue has the writer on it, and then it has the big spooky house in the background. The rest of the covers have the same view of the house with regardless of whatever else is in the panel. 
Uh, the second features the house with the entity. The third is the house with her glasses and music and her glasses happen to be reflecting the entity touching her face in an intimate way. Uh, the fourth cover has her afraid with a broken wine glass as the house freezes over. And the fifth has her, uh, it's basically just covered in monster eyes <clears throat> while the house is burning in the background. So I think that's a little bit of foreshadowing of what you can find out is going to happen at the end of the series. Whatever she is getting involved with is not going to end well. Hellions number 16, this is going to end at number 18 in December. Um, I've kind of loosely been keeping up with Hellions, honestly, because I just want to get to the point where Madeline Pryor comes back, which will be in issue 18 in December. This solicit just says, Fallout. The wheels have come off the Hellions bandwagon. They might all hate one another, but Nanny loves her latest addition. Who would be so cruel as to stomp on her happiness? It's not who you think. I honestly don't know who that would be. Like I said, I don't really care that much. I'm just waiting for Madeline. <laughs> New Mutants number 22. This is by Vita Ayala with art by Rod Reese, and it is stupendous. I talked about this run a little bit in my Inferno Prep podcast and how um, some of the topics that are being brought up in this are really, really relevant to much broader Krakoan life issues than just... Um, whatever may be on the surface. So um, I have actually the solicitations for issues 22, which comes out this week, as well as 23 and 24 going into November and December, because it does tell you a lot about what's going to happen in the story. Um, so we'll starting with 22, it says Shadow King Showdown. He's been skirting the line, skulking around the wild hunt, and now he's simply gone too far. On Krakoa, where the dead walk among the living and the unforgivable has been forgiven, the new mutants now battle an old foe, the psychic entity known as Shadow King. Um, so this is referencing he's simply gone too far, being he got Wolfsbane to kill Scout. Uh, Scout's fine, she's back, it's all good. Took a couple issues, but we're back. Um... The dead walking among the living and the unforgivable being forgiven is, of course, referencing the fresh start everyone gets on Krakoa and the fact that they have the resurrection protocols and that anyone, oh gosh, a certain era and up can be revived whether they're currently alive or not. So um, it's a lot of old, um, <laughs> old fights and things that are being settled because they have this fresh start and suddenly a whole new horizon. So that sounds all very yay, we're we're gonna get him. Now let's look at the, the solicit for issue twenty three. Fall of the Shadow Children. No more new mutants. Now there are only shadows. And the beast that's stalking them through infinity. Amal Farouk executes his master plan, but is he the one in control? So spoiler alert, whatever they're gonna go do in this issue to beat the Shadow King does not go well, and <laughs> they end up under his thumb. Not very surprising. He had already had a number of them kind of under his control. I don't think they even realized it based on their very cavalier attitudes about him kind of uh, grooming the young children. <laughs> Nobody thought that was weird. That's how you know there's a psychic already in their heads. Uh, but then let's read issue 24 solicitation. New status quo for the New Mutants. The New Mutants regroup af in the aftermath of the Shadow King's attack. What will become of Amal Farouk? Why is Warpath crying? How many snicks can fit into one panel? What happens to the Lofts when they find one another? All this and more in a single issue, plus the setup for the next big arc, a story too magical to be believed. As long as it's Vita, Yala, and Rod Reese, I, I'm cool with whatever the next arc is going to be. Um really, really been digging the speed of Yala Roderick's New Mutants. It is stupendous. Um, I really can't say enough good stuff about it. If you are looking for a Dawn of X, Reign of X book or comic that is consistently good, has um, some nice different plot lines going, um, and brings in a lot of new and old characters, New Mutants, go for that. That has been actually probably the most consistent um, Hickman-era X-book since the start. 
I, I, I feel like I can say that pretty safely. Captain Marvel number 33. Um, we have been following this last of the Marvel's plot line. I know I have already read this solicitation on the podcast before because I'm trying to get us to be all theorizing the same stuff and aware of what's coming next. So this says, the Marvels are under attack. First, they're coming for the captain. Now they're coming for the youngest to bear the title. Kara races to save Kamala Khan, but no one knows if they Carol, what the Mark Marvels are up to next or who will target. And this time, not even the dead are off limits. So they're probably going to do something with, um, if not even the dead are off limits. I'm sure that's referencing Marvel. Um, the end of this arc is going to bring together the Avengers and the Guardians of the Galaxy to fight off Fox Supreme. Uh, because we have a couple of these people, Novar, assuming that he shows up, and uh, burr, 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 Phyla Vell, they are both on Guardians right now, and then of course Carol uh, being on the Avengers, and then Monica with her history with the Avengers, and uh, Kamala actually as well, so... Um, I still think, I, I'm hoping that we don't get Marvel revived. That would genuinely suck. Um, what I'm hoping we have is Clert or whatever that, <laughs> that scroll who became Marvel in a way, um, took on the form and mindset, I suppose, of Marvel. I want him to come back because he just kind of is out there somewhere, has been t- talked about since he went off into space to do Marvel things. <laughs> but I'd love to see him come back, and I would love to see these characters involve themselves with each other a lot more often. And finally, The Amazing Spider-Man number 75. Um, I'm not following the series. I am just noting it for the sake of new era that is starting. It's going to be three Spider-Man books per month. That's a lot, and there's something like four different writers who are involved with it. I honestly don't have all the details, but if you're looking for a new era to start Spider-Man, check this out. But if you are looking for an era to have Peter Parker as Spider-Man, maybe not, because that's not what's happening here. It's a uh, uh, Kane. It's a Kane. It's not Kane. It's the other one. It's Ben Riley. Uh, that's the one. Ben Riley's not Spider-Man. So why not Miles? That's my question. Why not make Miles the main Spider-Man? Because people would be mad, that's why. Real quickly here, and this was unscheduled originally, I forgot to talk about Thor number 17 last week because I had been sipping around a little bit in my notes, but I want to mention it now because it does deserve to be mentioned, uh, especially because it does have Angela in it, who is one of my absolute favorite Marvel characters. So my discussion of Thor was planning to go something like this. Um, I really love how much Angela there is in that issue, but one thing that's kind of odd here is she has been developed to never care about the fate of Asgard before uh, Asgard even went as far as to label her as a traitor after she saved her younger sister, but I guess we're just ignoring that. Um, the artist on these issues draws Angela really, really well, but I do have the critique of he does not give her that much expression. I know she's a stone cold bitch, but there is a lot of expression in angry eyes. My guess here is that they were trying to make the effect of her smiling later on in the issue a lot stronger by keeping her expressionless otherwise, but I still think having her look like she's full of fire and rage would have been a far better compliment to her, uh, to her smile. Uh, There is a moment between Thor and Freya that they address his newfound, somewhat newfound knowledge that his true mother is Gaia, aka Mother Earth, something to do with by way of the phoenix force i didn't honestly read the issue it was avengers i want to say 44 um freya tells him thor how much he how she had changed his diapers and fed him from herself and he called her mother and so that's what she is um later on in the issue thor is concerned that he has no heir and he will be the last king and i had a few points that i wanted to get really bitchy about at first here um uh, uh, who's to say he can't still have a kid? You know, Odin probably could, so why not Odin's son? And he's talking, he's going to be the last king. Why can't there be a queen? We already know that he has a, he has spawn. He has three granddaughters. Um, and then I had another thing I wanted to point out, because um, actually scratch all that, because Thor is actually saying he refuses to have an heir because of 
the vision he has. You can have a kid, my boy. It's okay. Um, but Donny Cates has been quoted to be talking about how he did the whole Donald Blake plotline because he felt like Jason Aaron had touched on everything in the Thor mythos. And so that was like the one thing that he had left that he could kind of go for. Um, <clears throat> Jason Aaron, to the best of my knowledge, never revealed who the grandmother to Thor's granddaughters is. So that's a big obvious plot line that I would love to pick up if I was surviving Thor. Um, and he is taking it now, it seems. Um, plus Angela was never touched on in the Jason Aaron stuff. Um, I don't think she was ever really relevant to anything that he did there. Point being, I call BS on all of that. That was an excuse from Donny Gates um, for why those plot lines were so nonsensical. Um, and now that he's getting his footing we're just going to have to wait and see and if it continues to get better or what. Um, and the issue ends with just the Avengers discovering that, well, the Avengers calling to tell Thor that Mjolnir is no longer in uh, Avengers Tower, which, or not Tower, it's Avengers Mountain now. Avengers Mountain. So, trouble in, in the mountain. Lastly, we'll talk about Doom Patrol episode, or season three, episode four, uh, somewhat briefly here because it was a little bit of a self-explanatory episode that was called Undead Patrol, and it was goddamn hilarious. Basically, since everyone died in the previous episodes and came back, they're physically degrading. They're all kind of dying, becoming basically zombies. Um, the, I don't remember what his name in the show is, but he's the wizard guy. He's, was in Supernatural. Uh, he has the chief's head because I guess he's spiteful like that. Um, and has all these ideas about how to fix a Doom Patrol. Um, and then what was actually really super entertaining about the episode was how they handled them all being zombies. They were all kind of like Groot with the translations for their like various grunts and groans and hollers um, flashing across the screen like it's normal conversation captions <laughs> except it's ooh, ooh, uh, fuck you Niles you know is <laughs> what the captions say um, and in the end of the episode they end up having to eat Niles' head, Niles being the chief uh, to go back to normal, which, you know, the longer you think about that, the more horrible it becomes. Uh, and it makes it even funnier when Cliff can't get the others to tell him what Niles tasted like, because they just don't want to think about it. And he's, like, dying of curiosity. The only other thing um, that I recall being of great relevance in the episode was that it appears Negative Man is dying. Uh, a few episodes ago, he went off into space with his negative spirit and it left him, <laughs> or it seems to be that it left him. Um, and now he is back on Earth and not doing really well um, prior to the zombie stuff. Or, yeah, once the zombie stuff happened, it seemed that, oh, okay, the, the symptoms he was having was just more zombie symptoms like the rest of them. Um, but no, he is he puking up blue still post-zombie and seems to have some kind of, like, tumor or something on his side, I would theorize that it is an alien baby, because why not? Um, I, maybe the negative entity has birthed itself into him, doing some weird Avengers 200 shit. Um, I, don't, I don't know. But I'm sure it's going to be grody whenever we find out, and I'm into it. Uh, still been super digging Doom Patrol Season 4. I know this has been a really bad... Uh, rundown of what happened in that episode, but I really, it really was just hilarious shit with them as zombies running around doing zombie stuff and basically being like zombie crime detectives. It was pretty funny. I really enjoyed it. Um, all of the episodes up until season three, episode four, are streaming on HBO Plus, HBO Plus, HBO Max, um, if you are interested in seeing them. That wraps up today's episode of Sensational She Geek Live from Yancey Street. 
The next episode is going to be 36B, and that will be on Friday the 8th, unless I have something else happen, in which case I will update it on my Twitter page, which is, of course, Savage She Geek. So Friday the 8th, assuming everything is normal, you can expect the comic book pick list discussing things from this comic book pull list that ended up being good or noteworthy. You can also find me discussing uh, what if episode, whichever we're on now, which is going to be premiering on Wednesday at, or on Disney Plus, and then I'll also be talking Titans, the new Titans episode, which is premiering Thursday on HBO Max. The Doom Patrol episode 5 will also be premiering Thursday on HBO Max. We will wait till next Monday to discuss that, probably. In the meantime, thank you so much for listening to this episode as long as you do. Let me know your thoughts, your opinions, what you, you know, whatever feedback you have on what we discussed today, uh, because it is a discussion so that does take multiple people, you know, interacting and not just me talking. So interact, be involved, um, share this so more people get involved. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Um have a great week. We're cooling down. It is becoming more and more fall. Like the sun is setting earlier and earlier. So have a nice relaxing week. Try not to get too uh, caught up in all of life's bullshit. Uh, Don't be a piece of bullshit for somebody else to deal with and take a nap if you really need to. Get sweaty and have a nice week.